the first question from Anoop. He says, when I read how the little man thinks and operates, most of the thinking could be due to the experiences he went through and the environment he was brought up in till date. How does the little man come out of the conditioning he has been already subjected to? Does he have to strive to become a great man? Because both are similar when it comes to background and ambitions apparently. In a world where you come across daily people who are focused on their goals, their personal well-being, their ambitions, how can we remain part of the day-to-day -day life unaffected by external situations? Then, some personal issues and additional comments are there. Hmm. All right. Do we get the crux of the matter? The little man seems to be little for a reason. The reason lies in his upbringing, in his background in all that he has gone through. Hmm? So, the questioner is saying, what does he now do? Does he strive to become a great man? And then he says, when you daily come across people who have their own little ambitions, little plans, little personalities, little beliefs. How do you maintain a certain greatness within? Let's understand this. All are born little. All are born little. Just as we are born physically little, we are also born mentally little. What do I mean by mental littleness? It's only within a certain zone, a certain predefined zone that the mind operates. The child brings with herself an entire tranche of embedded conditioning. So it has been symbolically and poetically said that the child is not really born. What is born is a bundle of conditioning. So all are born little. Therefore nobody can be faulted for being little. Kindly absolve yourself of all guilt related to your Fundamental background. As far as we are concerned, we take ourselves to be born and mortal beings whose story begins with the moment of birth. So that's the background, right? Birth. Against that background, our entire life story plays out. Nobody need be ashamed of his background littleness. You didn't ask for it. You didn't opt for it. Conscious, unconscious, you had no choice whatsoever in this matter. 
So we are born little and we have very little choice with respect to our littleness for many long years. You are born little, what can you do about it when you are two years old? What do you do about it when you are five? What do you do about it once you are eight or ten? It could even be said, again very symbolically, I am not referring to any physical phenomena. It could even be said that the body is born at t is equal to zero. The soul starts taking birth at t is equal to 10 years. Please, I am not peddling superstition here. I am not saying that something actual, real, material or physical starts happening within the body or the brain at the age of 10 years. What I am saying is just a pointer. So what is happening then till the age of 10 years, there is really no soul. When I say soul, I mean an internal locus of control. Hmm? I mean something within that is purely yours. Something within that is truly original and authentic. That is just not there till you are let's say 7 or 8 or 10. The time may vary. It could be 6, it could be 12. But you get the drift, right? You get the idea. The child is in a sense almost 100% automatic. The child has nothing separate from his automaticity. He is his bones, he is his muscles, he is his DNA. He has nothing to observe the whole process. He has nothing that stands apart from his physical apparatus. He has no capacity then for self-observation or reflection. We are talking of young kids, five or seven year olds. And then comes a point when the brain starts maturing enough. And when I say maturing, I just mean physical maturity. <coughs> Man is constructed in a way that his consciousness is dependent on the physical thing called brain. So the brain has to be ripe enough to be the seat of consciousness. If the brain is not ripe, if the brain is yet very primitive, then consciousness will be forced to be primitive. Are you getting it? You cannot have Buddha consciousness in an amoeba. Very difficult. An amoeba is bound to have an amoebic consciousness. Similarly, a child is constrained by the limitations of her brain to have a childish consciousness. Are you getting it? Then comes a point when the brain is ready. Now there is free will or at least the possibility of it. Now it is possible to see what is going on, not outside. Outside the child starts seeing even at the age of 15 days. Hmm? The ears start receiving inputs, the eyes start seeing something faintly. All that starts happening when the child is just a few days old maybe. But around the age of 8 to 10 years, the child starts developing a watching consciousness. And there is no magic involved in it. It's just that the number of brain cells has multiplied. The right areas of the brain have become developed enough, big enough. You can measure their mass. You can measure their size, the number of cells, the, the quantity of blood flow. All these things can be measured and you can know now that the brain is ripe enough to have now a watching consciousness. A consciousness that can know. Know what is really going on. Going on outside, going on within itself. 
the process continues till the age of let's say 13 14 15 by that time approximately the brain is fully ripe to receive any kind of inputs now the brain is in a position where it can not merely have knowledge it can also have realization so till the age of 8 or 10 nobody has any responsibility to be free of littleness only till the age of 8 or 10 till the age of 8 or 10 you simply do not have the wherewithal to look at yourself you therefore cannot be blamed or faulted are you getting it but after that you are responsible because now you are capable at the age of 16 if a youngster is behaving in utterly conditioned ways then he is to be blamed not the 6 year old but the 16 year old is to be blamed because the 16 year old now has the capacity for self observation he is just deciding not to use it therefore please understand the matter very clearly nobody is responsible or nobody is to be faulted or castigated for being conditioned why because we are born conditioned we are not merely born conditioned we are also born with a strong tendency to stay conditioned and gather even more conditioning so that's the kind of problematic hardware with which we are born the way we are born we are born not merely to stay conditioned but also accumulate more conditioning depending on the already accumulated conditioning are you getting it it's almost like dv by dt being proportional to v your acceleration is proportional to your velocity now what will happen the more your velocity is the more will be your acceleration and the more your acceleration will be the more your velocity will be the more your velocity will be the more your acceleration will be it's a very dangerous situation the curve will now be exponential so we are born with some conditioning and we are born with the tendency to create layers and layers upon the kind of conditioning we are born with so we must not blame ourselves the blame does not lie there the blame lies elsewhere you are not to be faulted for being born conditioned but you are to be surely faulted for not being responsible for your liberation are you getting it you are not to be faulted for perspiring everybody sweats but you are to be faulted for not cleaning up for not washing up if you are stinking it would be wrong to blame you for perspiring what can you do perspiration is there in the body but if you perspire then it is your responsibility to wash up why don't you wash up the little man is not to be blamed for being little he is to be blamed for remaining little do you get the difference it's a it's an important difference he is not responsible for not being little he is responsible to do the maximum that he can to not to remain little and therein lies now the difference between the little man and the big man or the great man the great man is nothing but the little man who at some point says it's no fun remaining little are you getting it and he is born exactly similar to the little man 
Now that puts the little man in the dock. If he could say that he doesn't want to remain little, why couldn't you? It is the presence of the great man that castigates the little man. If no greatness were possible at all, then there was no justification in pointing fingers at littleness. But greatness is possible. Greatness is possible and it is materially proven in the shape, form and figure of the great man. If he could do it, why couldn't you? He had all the vices that you have. He had all the tendencies that you have. He still has them. Some part of him will always remain little. Littleness is a congenital condition. You just cannot totally do away with it. You can tend towards complete freedom. Hmm? Like in calculus, you can tend towards the absolute. You can tend towards being absolutely free, but you can never reach absolute freedom. A little bit will always remain. If he can do what he is doing and what he has done, in spite of all his littlenesses, why can't you? That is the question the little one has to answer. Hmm? So the little man's charge sheet does not say that the little man is there and the great man is there and therefore the little man must be prosecuted. The charge sheet says the great man is also a little man. Read the charge sheet. It says, the great man is also a little man. Therein lies your offense. Had the great man just been great, then the little man is allowed to stay little. But the great man is not just great. He purposefully, deliberately, effortfully, decides to not to remain little and if he can decide that, if he can impose that kind of determination and discipline upon himself, why can't you? That's what your charge sheet reads. You are guilty of failing yourself. You are guilty of not living up to your own potential. Are you getting it? Now, the question is, how does the little man turn into greatness? Littleness is problematic. Littleness involves suffering. And therefore, it is not greatness that you target. You target freedom from suffering. In targeting freedom from suffering, you do not even realize when you have left your littleness behind bit by bit bit by bit and once you have left your littleness behind one day somebody walks up you to you and says hey gritty now that is not what you were aiming at you didn't want to be called a great you just wanted to leave your pettiness behind and that is an authentic objective if you target greatness then you will remain little and use the badge of greatness to defend your littleness. Do you get the difference between these two approaches? Those who target greatness are hell-bent on remaining little and they will achieve greatness. What kind of greatness? The greatness that speaks through medals and honors and podiums and certifications. That kind of greatness. They will get a sir or something prefixed against their names. Now we are great. Now we are noble. Where? Outwardly. Inwardly they will remain little. So, 
the one who left littleness behind was not really targeting greatness. You cannot target greatness because greatness is inconceivable. Can you have a conception or an image of greatness? If you cannot have it, how can you target it? What then is a more real and justified and genuine objective? Freedom from littleness. And why did the great man seek freedom from littleness? Because littleness hurts. Littleness, doesn't it? Does it or not? It hurts. It hurts. And man is under no compulsion to tolerate and keep tolerating hurt. Hmm? The little man, the hurt little man tried and found that it was possible to be free of hurt and suffering and all the pettiness. He just had to compromise a little on his identity. He just had to give up a few things which he used to take as valuable. And it was possible to leave a little bit of hurt behind. And it encouraged him. He said if even a minor movement can happen, then great instances are also possible, aren't they? The initial success spurred him on. He took bigger risks. He imposed greater discipline upon himself. He said the returns are sweet. I want to invest more in this process. And bit by bit, day by day, decision by decision, event by event, he just kept leaving the littleness behind. One day the world started calling him great. Absolutely, he is not yet great because the absolute is not a point to be ever achieved. Absolutely no one is great. The one you are calling as great is great just because he has left his lit relative littleness behind. Then where is the absolute in all this? The absolute is grace. Without the blessings of the absolute, the little one couldn't have succeeded. In fact, the little one is succeeding because he is humble enough to realize that he is little. And because he is humble enough to realize that he is little, he tells himself, what I have done is a big thing. And for sure, the way I was, this big project couldn't have been completed or taken forward. Surely it is something outside of my littleness that is helping me. Therein comes the absolute. Now he says it is by the blessings of the absolute that I have been able to put my littleness relatively behind. Not that I have become absolutely great. I haven't become absolutely great. I am yet only relatively great. But I would attribute my progress, my liberation to the Absolute. Are you getting it? Then the questioner says, but I come across little people regularly, daily, they are all over the place, they are all around me. How do I remain unaffected? Exactly because they are all around you. So their life is verifiable. Is it or not? If they are all around you, they are available to be observed. No? If they are all around you, then they cannot hide the facts of their life. 
What is the fact of their life? Littleness, hurt, suffering, tension, fear. So you are saying, because they are all around me, so they influence me. I am saying, because they are all around you, that is reason enough to be, not to be like them. He is there and I can see tension on his face. I can see suffering on his face, fear on his face, discord on his face, hate on his face. And they are all around me. Now what will their presence do? What must their presence do? It should encourage me to not to become one of them, no? I should say, oh, I see all of them. And none of them is a worthy figure. The more I look at them, the more determined I feel to not to join them. So I do not really get the question. When you say, I am surrounded by a crowd of little men, then how do I avoid littleness? Exactly because the crowd is pitiable. Had you said that you do not know any little men, then the situation would have been dangerous because now littleness is not available to you for observation. Because it is not available, therefore, it can capture you. It can deceive you. Because you do not know it. You have not seen it. Now that you are seeing littleness every moment, how do you fall prey to it? How do you afford to? Tell me. Hmm? The right intention has to be there. That's all. Everything that you will present in defense of littleness, everything that you will quote in defense of your littleness can be just turned around and presented as a reason to not to be little. It depends on your attitude. Come up with a reason to stay little. The same reason can be used to not to stay little. You say, oh, they pressurize me to stay little, therefore I am little. The, somebody else may just turn around and say, I do not like pressures. Therefore, the moment somebody pressurizes me, I do the opposite of what he wants me to. You are saying, I did what I did because he pressurized me. Somebody else may say, because he was trying to pressurize me. So I, with determination insisted that I will not do what he wants me to do. Because I don't work under pressure. So do not try to quote any reason or any factor in defense of littleness. Littleness cannot be defended. If you are defending littleness, you are actually saying that you want to condemn yourself to perpetual suffering, which is indefensible, is it not? Be compassionate towards yourself and have faith that freedom is possible. And life can be enjoyed really. Life need not be a melancholy song. It can be a symphony of ecstasy. That faith has to be there. Do not Surrender so easily to the forces of littleness. They will keep telling you, who are you to demand freedom? You are just a petty fellow. Don't listen to them. By virtue of being conscious, you have all the rights to be liberated as well. Full stop. Irrespective of what your past is, 
irrespective of what your current conditions are, irrespective of what kind of actions you have accumulated over your lifetime, none of that matters. Till the day you are conscious, you have a right to be joyfully conscious. Are you getting it? And joy, when I say I do not really mean happiness or pleasure. I mean a state of depth in consciousness. Hmm? So the ball is always in our court. If we do not hit it right, we are responsible. What's more, you do not just get one chance to hit it right. Every passing moment is an opportunity to fire in a fresh serve. You cannot even say that I missed the bus. It's a busy route. There is a bus every second minute. And if you are found never boarding any bus, then it is not your misfortune. It is your misjudgment. Hmm? 